This is the third of the In the Night, In the Air Tonight sessions. Um, it's presented by Ollie Witt, and you've got Barry, Paul, and Jeb, who's, uh, who's in the background there, and they're going to be answering your questions throughout the evening. Um, the most important thing I think here is, is, is really the questions towards the end. Wait for Ollie to get through, as Andy said. You know, this is something that we're, we're all looking forward to listening to. Um, you know, miniature pylon racing sounds absolutely amazing. Um, great subject. And I'm going to pass over to Ollie now and let Ollie get on with it, if that's all right. Thank you, Ollie. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, great. Well, firstly, thanks very much, everyone, for, for joining. I, I can't actually see the, the Zoom window, so I can't, luckily, I guess, see how many of you, of you there are. Uh, it's a bit weird for me. I'm sat in a kind of empty office at the minute, so to know there's kind of 250-odd of you in the background, that's uh, it's quite scary, but all good. Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this. going to do a bit of an intro into pylon racing. We'll talk about some of the, uh, the different classes that we do here in the UK and some of the technicalities about those. And then we'll also um, go in and try and discuss uh, how a, a kind of standard race meet runs so that if anyone wants to come in and join, you'll have all the resources and you know what you're getting yourself into if you do want to come and have a race. Um, right, great. So uh, as, as you guys know, there's, there's four of us here at the minute. Um, as myself, Folly. So uh, this is me with one of my uh, quarter 40 models that I had a, a good race meeting with. Uh, I think that hit pylon three that day. Not the first time, probably not the last. Um, I've been flying pylon for uh, about 12 years now. Uh, did lots of different model flying before that. Um, used to work for uh, Overlander batteries. So some of you uh, might know me through, through that. And uh, I now um, work, uh, I guess, kind of partly due to Pylon. It's definitely helped me. I work as a, uh, a UAV design engineer. So uh, that, that's me. Um, we've also got Barry Lever. Um, Barry's had a, a career in kind of composite manufacture and, and development. His models are pristine when you see them. He's always got some little trick little bits on them. He's a really keen uh, machinist and it's always finicking and over that, that last little detail, which is kind of what, what Pylon's about. Uh, we've got Paul Bardot, the big character that is big in uh, stature and big in voice, I guess. Uh, he's a hacker and Jetty UK distributor. Uh, and for his sins, he has been multiple times British champion uh, in, in a few of the different classes. He's been um, racing Pylon since he could walk uh, and, and, and all that stuff. So. Um, yeah, big, big personality within the Pylon uh, community. He, he also organises a lot of our uh, club kind of short course races that we that we do. Um, we've also got Geb Jones. Geb, uh, heavily involved in the, the BMPRA. Um, he's the, the chairman at the moment. Um, been flying Pylon for kind of 20 years. He and his son, Ben, uh, dominated F3D uh, for a while uh, until Ben moved away to America, thank God, uh, gave us all, uh, the rest of us, a bit of a chance. So, uh, yeah, Geb, super technical. He's a, uh, a professor at, at Cambridge in the physics department there. Um, re really, F3D especially is all about uh, all about tuning the engines, and Geb's, Geb's a bit of a whiz at that. Um, right, so let's get into it, I guess. So the basics of pylon racing, for those that don't know, we fly around a, a course with three pylons, which I'll go into a bit more detail in a second. Um, a standard race, whenever we can, uh, is, is three aircraft. Sometimes in the UK, if we haven't got the numbers, we'll drop that down to two, but we always try and have a three up heat. You basically take off, you fly 10 laps around the course, and then cut your engine and you come in to glide. Uh, so it's, it's dead simple in terms of format, uh, but it is really a, a team sport. So it's you, a pilot and a caller. So your caller is going to launch the model for you. He's going to call you when you've passed that first pylon and he's going to tell you when the, when the race is finished. He's going to let you know how the other aircraft are doing, uh, kind of get you around, keep you on the course. It really is a team sport. The nice thing about pylon is it's a time trial. So it's not... I, I don't. I think some of the aerobatic classes and, and uh, scale classes can come down to kind of 
a grey area of judgment, whereas in pylon, it's literally you against the clock and uh, and it's, it's very black and white. And if you go to anywhere in the world for some of these classes, you'll be racing the same rules on the same course on the you know same day. Maybe the atmospherics have changed, but how good you are at pylon is all that really matters. Um, we do a staggered start. So the aircraft get pushed off or, or thrown, depending on the class, with about a one second interval. Uh, we had to try and minimize the carnage. Doesn't always work, but uh, definitely helps. So staggered starts. The, the pilots, when you're flying pylon, you actually stand inside the course. And that's basically uh, because it's really safety first. Uh, actually standing inside the course is, is the safest place. You're never fully flying at yourself. Um, so, so, so that's why we do that. And that can take, take a bit of getting used to, but just another one of the challenges. And then the last thing, go fast, turn left. That's that pretty simple, like I was saying. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great class. So the course, uh, like I was saying, triangle of course with, uh, with, with three pylons. We've got the number one at the top, number two, and the number three pylon down here. Uh, as, a, as a pilot, you would stand closer to, to these two, to the pylons two and three, you'd stand closer to the base pylons where the start finish line is. So your model will get pushed off at the start of the race because a uh, starter will have dropped the starting flag and it'll go up to number one. And as it passes uh, the number one pylon, what might happen is this, this pylon uh, judge number one who sat perpendicular to the course, when he sees that pass between uh, his kind of vision line and that pylon he'll either drop a flag or press a button and a light will come on and then that's when you know you've passed and you can start turning around in reality if that's what you've done if you've waited for the light to come on or the flag to drop you've gone way past by the time you've started pulling on the elevator to turn and come back so you really need to start um kind of judging how far you are going down yourself and pulling and your, your caller could be doing that for you. So you, your caller could be the one judging and you could just be listening to him uh, or you could be doing it yourself and your caller could be confirming how far, how close you are to the pylon. Um, there's two different courses that we use. Uh, this 180 meter course that you see here, so the distance from number one to number two is for uh, what we call an FII course. And then in the UK, we also run a short course, which is uh, 140 meters. And that's just so we can run slightly slower, slower models, but still have uh, kind of comparable times between the classes. Um, and there are some other judges, so pylon two and three, they also have judges um, sat, uh, these ones are sat at 45 degrees to the course. So an interesting thing about pylon is that, although it's all about flying around the pylons, you don't actually have to fly round the pylons to make the course. If you just fly uh, between uh, or across the kind of visual wall that this judge has got here on this red line, then you'll complete the lap. So if you fly inside pylon two, but you fly a little bit deep, you can actually make a harder turn and come back. It's not the fastest way to fly the course, but if you've made a mistake, then you, you can do that. Um, if you do, uh, kind of not make the course, you don't cross this line, you fly too tightly. If you do that for, for one pylon during your 10 laps, you get 10% of your time added on. Uh, and if you do it twice, you'll get a 200 time for that, uh, for that race, which is basically a disqualification. So a standard time for, for most of the classes is uh, about 60 to 70 seconds. Uh, the really fast guys are going lower than that, but 60 to 70 seconds. So if you're carrying a 200 time at the end of the, the meeting, that's really going to hurt you. You know, you're instantly dropped down. The world championships for uh, FAI, for example, is, is 14 heats. And I think you're allowed to drop three. So over, over four days, you've got to do 14 heats. And if you uh, cut twice more than uh, three times, or if your engine doesn't start one time, you'll get a 200 time. So it's really about consistency, really about, yes, going fast, but also just putting in times. Um, so although the course is kind of quite simple, there's, there's quite a bit of technicality to it. Um, this was actually a, a mathematical study that was done by a, a German um, a, a German chap. 
And what this basically shows is that if you fly a, a really wide course, your model will go, go very fast. You know, he's, he's kind of up at 84 meters a second here, 85 meters a second. But because um, the, the course is so much larger, the actual time that you're getting is much higher. So if you start decreasing the, the size of that radius of the turn, i.e. how hard you're pulling at the top and around the bases, you, you, your time will start going quicker. But then if you start pulling too hard, effectively, you, you'll start slowing the model up. You'll start putting too much drag on in the turns and, uh, and your, your times will start going back up again. Um, and it's not quite as black and white as this, because say if you've got your airframe uh, and your model set up to be really good at kind of accelerating out of the course or out of the turn, then you might actually want to start doing one of these really tight courses because you're going to be able to get up to speed a lot quicker. So quite a simple course, but still quite difficult. And it's all about kind of being very precise, very smooth, also quite aggressive. You know, you, you're flying a 200 mile an hour model quite close to the floor and you've got to be comfortable putting it on knife edge and pulling hard elevator. Um, so yeah, it's quite a, quite a tricky thing to get used to, but really exhilarating. There's nothing like it for me. Um, last thing about kind of the course, obviously for, for safety as spectators, we, uh, we we keep the course quite a long way away from spectators. So you might have seen if you've come to like the nationals, for example. Um, so to get out there, we we go on these these trucks. Uh, here you see see Ben uh, Gebson sat on the truck and he's wearing a helmet here in the uk we mandate that we've got to have these uh, face coverings or the cheek coverings in the helmet as well so uh, these um, baseball helmets that they use um some of the best ones and the guys here have also got air defenders on um you've got a minute to start your engines at the uh, the start of a race so to have one of these engines at kind of 30 35 000 rpm screaming in your ear is uh um pretty loud so we don't mandate it but definitely wear ear defenders especially if you call um right so the types of classes we've got so talk about two different types of classes which correlate to the kind of short course and the long course the fai the federation aeronautic international um they run all of their kind of air sports so from hang gliding rocketry uh and then all the way to you know model aircraft flying. If it's got an F number, F3D, F3T, it's an FII sport. Um, and in the UK, the, the BMPRA, the British Miniature Pylon Racing Association, we hold a kind of club classes, short course classes, which are designed to kind of mm, allow you to get into pylon a bit, uh, you know, make it a bit more accessible. And we've got freedom over the rules more. So. The kind of two main classes that we race in the UK in, in FAI are F3T, uh, which you might know as quarter 40, and F3D. And F3T is kind of more of a stock class. It's, it's a lot cheaper than F3D. Um, the, there's not much you can do to the engines. You can't modify them. You can set them up differently if you want. Um, but but that kind of reduces the complexity quite a lot. There's no tuned pipe, so they come with a standard muffler and you have to use that. Um, and there's off the shelf propellers uh, and off the shelf plugs. Airframes are a little bit cheaper. But then if you want to, you can move up to F3D, which is kind of largely unlimited. Um, there's, there's just like in kind of Formula One racing, there's, there's rules and guidelines to, to make sure everyone's flying the same class of vehicle. But what you can do to that is, is pretty much whatever you want. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about the kind of technicalities of that. But what it does mean is that the models are quite a bit more expensive. There's always something better to buy kind of thing. Um, and there's, there's a lot of work to maintain them and kind of build it up. But I promise you, when you get an F3D motor started on the line, there's just nothing like it. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, there are some other FII uh, pylon racing classes, such as F3R and F3E. Uh, F3R, flown a lot in the States. Uh, you might know it as, as Quickie 500. Um, they run a similar kind of power setup and uh, stuff to quarter 40 and F3T, but it's a bit of a simpler model, a bit of a slightly slower model. So just making FII, again, a bit more accessible. Um, and then there's also F3E, um, which was known as F5D, 
Uh, and that's an electric car. So they run a, a kind of limiter to make sure the speed is all the same. So it's all about um, making your power setup as efficient as you can be. So we'll get into some details of, of and some kind of technicalities of F3D, which, uh, like I was saying, is like the, like the F1 uh, of, of pylon racing. Uh, this is a typical F3D model. This is the Voodoo from Big Bruce Racing. It's fully composite. This model's got a, an upright engine, so you can see uh, here the engine's kind of cowled in and then the exhaust uh, tuned pipe sticking out the back there. Uh, that's a kind of personal preference. You can have them inverted or upright, some even have them on the side. Uh, it's up to you. You can have V-tails, you can have T-tails. Um, generally, all the aircraft are quite high aspect ratio to keep the efficiency up of a lot of G in the turns um, and that's what really kind of drives you towards composite manufacture. Uh, lots of carbon in these airframes, lots of Kevlar uh, to get the stiffness and the strength up. This is a typical F3D um, engine. This is an MB40 designed by a guy called Rob Meckermeyer in, in Holland uh, and manufactured by a Ukrainian company called Profi. Uh, it's a 6.5 cc engine for, for F3D, which is basically the same as a, any 40 size engine you'd be used to. The difference is that on straight fuel, uh, so methanol with a bit of caster, these are kicking out five horsepower um, at about 35,000 RPM. Um, and they're doing that as well with a, an air intake restrictor that you can see, see here. Um, F3D, if you get everything, if you get everything right and you've got to the line and it's going to work, then how fast you go is kind of determined by how well you have matched your prop size to your pipe length and all of your engine setup. And you've got just a strong engine, you know, it's, it's nice and clean. There's no pitting on the piston. Uh, there's, a, there's a good ceiling ring on the piston, all those kind of things. So it's really a kind of, a bit of an art form in terms of two-stroke uh, tuning and and really really putting your finger in the air and saying it feels a bit humid today. I think we need to drop the head volume, for example. Um, so lots of running up, lots of the really fast guys go out and they just run engines and do lots and lots of flying. Some of the guys in the states I know kind of put 50 flights in a day when they're leading up to a world championship. So absolutely mental. Um, but that just gives them the ability to kind of think, oh, it feels, you know, there's a bit of, it's, it's, the temperature's gone up. We need to, we need to make this change. And then when they do it, it just works. Uh, here you see a, uh, an MB and, uh, and a tuned pipe in, in an airframe. This is uh, one of Paul's airframes, but manufactured by, uh, by Barry and uh, another chap, Nathan, who, who races with us. And uh, Barry and Nathan, like I was saying, very keen machinists and, and composite. So they've developed the fuselage uh, of this airframe completely from scratch. And Nathan's machined a very kind of unique belly pan for this. So you can see the fuselage stops and goes vertical at this point. And they've bolted on a, um, a, a belly pan, which basically means that the whole front of the aircraft is, is metal. Um, and what that allows them to do is that you, they can, by simply removing four bolts and cutting some locking wire, uh, they can bring the whole power setup out of the aircraft. Um, there's no throttle linkage, obviously, wide open all the time. Um, so that allows them to, to kind of really quickly say they've got a problem with the engine or they just want to want to drop a new air engine in. They can do that without removing the prop, without removing the pipe. Um, and get it in and out really quickly. So kind of a nice, unique thing there. Um, they also run this this lead coming up here is running an onboard glow. That's quite nice because it allows you to run a little bit richer. So uh, everything's running a little bit cooler. You'll stop putting holes in pistons uh, quite as much. It might still happen. Uh, but yeah, that's definitely something that probably will happen to you at some point if you start racing F3D. Uh, Sorry for the poor quality of the picture on this one. This is a, a, a typical F3D tank. It's a six ounce bladder tank. So there's a, there's a rigid um, a rigid outer plastic tank and inside there's a flexible bladder. And what you do is you, the, the pressure from the tuned pipe is piped to the outside of that bladder. And so it squeezes the bladder closed. And what that does is, is pressurize your fuel and pump it into your engine. 
the the way that we fill those bladder tanks is with a, a syringe like this. So what you do is it's, it's not just like kind of cranking in fuel like you would for a normal model. You actually pull all the air out of the, of the bladder. So the bladder collapses completely. Uh, and then you pump in purely fuel. So you fill that bladder with, with nothing but fuel. There's no air in there now. Um, and that means that as the outside of that bladder is squeezed by the pipe pressure, the engine gets a really constant, nice supply of, uh, of fuel into it. If you if you get an air bubble into an F3D engine, you might drop off the RPM range, and that they're so finicky that that uh, if you do drop too far off, it might not recover. It might fall off the pipe. Everything will get too cool, and you'll just stop in the air. So very critical. The the, the fuel system in a in an F3D model is is take priority over quite other things, and that's um that's kind of leading on to this this uh, piece of equipment here. Looks like a really simple thing. Um, and this is like something that I think kind of sums up Pylon quite nicely. And there's always little bits that you can do to improve your kind of performance and allow you to get out there and just do a good time, come back, fuel up, go out, do another one. Um, this is a fuel shut off. And it, it basically, it's a fuel shut off, but there's no interruption of the fuel line. So this fuel line passes through a, a looped, a loop in a wire and simply by pulling that wire into an appropriately sized tube you you get a kink in the fuel line um which which stops the fuel so a really nice little shut off the other nice thing about this little mechanism is that if you uh, depower the servo that's driving this because you've pulled the pipe right into the uh, into the tube it won't actually uh, the, the kink won't release so if you've got your model off and you're waiting for your race what won't happen is that your engine will flood and when you get to the line you put the starter on hydraulic lock um all those all those little things we've got a a, a joke but it's actually like really reality that there's a, a million and one things that can go wrong in rc pylon racing so any little bits like this that you can do not an expensive change but uh will help you massively when you get to the line uh f3d you can do whatever you want with the props uh, i don't think you're allowed one uh, single bladed props but um, basically all, all the props are kind of custom. This is a, a mold that Geb has manufactured. Um, and it's really kind of like, I, I guess, like a, um, it, it, it really evolves um, with, the, with the mechanic. So uh, Geb might take a, a prop from this mold, modify it, might add some bits here, take some bits off there, make a new mold, and then he's, uh, you know, make some more of those when he wants to make a new change. So uh, almost like a, a sourdough starter for a baker, I guess. It kind of goes with you and you, you, you see that people have um, kind of moved their props along in time. Um, this, is a, this is a hub prop. So you see that the central thing here uh, almost looks like a, a spinner. So you wouldn't need a a conventional spinner like like you're used to on this prop um and that helps a little bit with aerodynamics you know there's no kind of hole here where the where the blade comes out but i think what it really helps with is the stiffness of the blade so um it, it just helps that prop be really stiff not flex you can put maximum performance through it you know put five horsepower through a seven inch prop uh this is uh, this is paul and, and barry going out um this picture is quite nice, shows a kind of very different model that you've got. This is one of their, their T-tail Evo models. Um, what they're doing here is that as you walk out for a race, you walk out to the line, the first thing you'll do is you'll, you'll hold your model up and it's called identifying. So the starter will be on the radio to all the judges and they'll be saying, uh, this is Barry Lever identifying on lane blue uh, with his red and orange model. And then all those judges know that when that model uh, that, that kind of red and orange model takes off from the ground. That's the one they're looking at. That's the one they've got to make sure is going around the pylons. Can get difficult when you've got two red models on the line, but uh, the judges are usually pretty good. A bit of a size comparison between F3D and, and a quarter 40 model here. Uh, this, is, this one's also a, a Club 32 model, which we'll, we'll get on to talking. So quarter 40 is a, a little bit smaller. Uh, F3T, I should say, sorry, is a little bit smaller. Um, but the speed of a, a quarter 40 model is really made up um, 
they're, they're almost about the same speed, even though the engine is uh, kind of a lot simpler because of the fuel. So uh, they run a 15% nitro in quarter 40. So very simply then you've got up to the same speed. Um, all the models of quarter 40 models look lovely. They're, they're all kind of supposed to be semi-scale Reno races. Uh, so this is a cauldron manufactured by a guy called uh, Bruce de Chastel, Australian guy. Um, so yeah, kind of lovely looking models. Uh, this is a, a Nelson quarter 40 um, engine. And like I was saying, very simple, no, no tuned pipe, kind of bolts together, standard-ish glow plugs, um, st standard spinners, the props are all off the shelf. So uh, a much more kind of accessible way into, into FAI racing and getting on that, that course, you'll get used to the speed of an F3D model. If you're looking at getting into F3D, I'd definitely recommend that you do at least a year, a season of, of quarter 40 racing, get to know the people, um, get to know things like they use some of the same systems as F3D. So the bladder tanks, the fueling systems, get to know that kind of procedure, uh, get your ducks in a row and then uh, have a go on F3D. Um, we race quarter 40 in, in the UK uh, because it, it originated from America. So and in America, it's a, it's a huge thing. So this is a race in Phoenix. I think they had 50 or 60 pilots, which is pretty regular for them over there. And you get these, uh, these this is a practice day and there's these lines of models waiting for them. So I think they actually do four repeats over there and it's just relentless racing. Yeah. Um, I wanted to show you guys, and that's kind of a common question that we get, like how much does this all cost? Uh, don't let it scare you. There's some, some relatively big numbers. Uh, I think any RC modeling can, can go mental if you want it to. Um, but there is also, you know, you can do it quite cheaply. If you, so, so a quarter 40 setup, if you, if you buy everything fairly new, is going to cost you around a thousand pounds. If you want to get into it and you want to get racing, come and have a chat to us. We'll let you know when there's something going second hand and you can get something in the air for around 500 quid. F3D, you're probably looking at around 1500 quid. Um, if, if you're looking at buying things fairly new. Um, and again, if you, if you're, if you come and have a chat to us, let us know that you want to come racing. We'll we'll figure something out, and it'll probably cost you. You know, you can do it for an, under a grand. Get a setup going. The the kind of slight difficulty with F three D is that it does chew through ancillaries. So you're going to be doing a plug every time you start that engine. Um, if you don't put the prop on in the correct kind of orientation and it noses over, you can do a fifty or sixty pound prop. Um, so th there there is some some running costs associated with F three D, but trust you it's worth it it's uh yeah it's absolutely brilliant <laughs> um right so that was that was fii the some kind of club classes that we run on a on a sh slightly shorter course is we've got we've got two classes here in the uk we've got club 32 which is an evolution of club 20 which ran in the 70s and 80s and that was a 20 size engine with a tune pipe um and we've kind of taken those air, those old airframes, all the old molds, and we've started putting 32 size engines in them. Um, but that's all, uh, they're about the same speed as what Club 20 was, but a lot more affordable. Uh, we've, we've driven the rules to be basic materials, basic construction techniques. And generally, you can go into a model shop and buy everything you need in order to get a Club 32 model going. Um, we also have a, an electric short course class called E2K, um, and that was the evolution of, of kind of Club 2000, which used this size uh, airframe, but for IC, then they started going electric with them. Um, and that's all stock components again. The only thing that we do have with that is a, a power limited speed controller. So what that basically does is everyone's running the same prop, everyone's running the same class of motor, uh, electric motor. So if you limit the RPM, uh, which we do through the speed controller, just by a very simple programming, um, everyone is basically at the same speed. The models are similar enough that everyone's at the same speed. And it's a super simple to build, super so simple to kind of put together and fly and operate. Uh, so Club 32, this is a, a tempo. Um, and 
a typical Club 32 model has a, a fiberglass fuselage, um, foam wing with a with a balsa, ben, balsa veneer. This one's uh, been glass cloth by the looks of it, nice shiny finish on it. So you can get some quite nice looking some airframes. Um, three kind of cheap servos that go into it and your standard running gear and you're good to go. Um, I like this Club 32 class because it's actually given me quite a bit of scope to to to, to play around and experiment. I, I've been putting together uh, my own moulds and um, an airframe for myself. Um, and it's cost me about kind of 200 to 250 quid in tooling. You can do it cheaper if you want to. I've gone like a machined route. Um, you can do it a lot cheaper if you want to just carve up a plug. So if you want to get into composite manufacture and learn about that kind of thing and apply it to something, definitely recommend Club 32 or E2K for that matter. Um, you've got a lot of scope to do things quite kind of cheaply. Club 32 engines, you've got three to choose from. There's the ASP, uh, the West 32 and the SC. I don't think the SC's made anymore, but there's a lot kicking around, especially second hand. Really cheap. They're exactly like, well, you know, an ASP and an SC are ex exactly what you know. The West is um, simply a, a standard West 32, but with a, a different um, exhaust manifold on it. So if you can operate a normal IC engine, you can operate one of these because that's exactly what they are. E2K, this is a typical E2, E2K model. Uh, usually a built-up construction, or you can have a, a composite fuselage. They're really boxy, which means they're dead simple to put together, you know, just slab-sided, uh, not even much sanding or carving to do. Uh, the wings have got all straight tapers on them, same in Club 32 as well. You can play around and uh, have go low-mounted low wing or top-mounted wing, but that box construction, which just makes them dead simple to put together, you can put Kind of three of these models together get three of them to a race and you know you're going to be racing all day no matter what problems you have um and again they're they're just kind of basic simple small electric models really uh with quite a bit more power than they probably should have in them but kind of very manageable and uh, i think a lot of the people that get hold of them uh are kind of get excited by them for a while and then they get excited by the racing and and uh, get into kind of they relax when they're flying them. So yeah, great great classes. This is another example. This is a, a Dutch E2K model, uh, and this one has actually got a, a composite fuselage. So as long as you keep that box uh, box shape, you can do kind of whatever you want. Um, all the rules for these classes are available on uh, a Facebook group, which I'll give you the links to later. Uh, you don't have to go. Um, Foam and balsa veneered wings. Uh, this is a, an Evolution Models airframe, and uh, he, he didn't want to go the foam route, so he did a built-up wing. It's absolutely fine, as long as you keep that straight taper, which is defined by the wings, until you get to the wingtips. I think there's a, uh, I think it's 30 mil or, or something from the wingtip. You can kind of do whatever you want on the wingtip. Uh, this is how a typical E2K kit comes. This is a, a Wasp from Cloud Models. I think this is. I think this costs around fifty-five or sixty quid. Um, dead simple, castellated parts, clicks together, glue it up, and uh, uh, and cover it, and you, you kind of can be racing pretty quickly. And, and that's the idea. There is some uh, th there is some damage that sometimes occurs at some of these race meets. Let's say so. Uh, having quite a simple, uh, simple cheap airframes is a is a, is a big bonus. And again, simple powertrain. If you can if you can put together an electric model, you can put together one of these. Dead simple. Uh, 4S2000 battery, um, standard ESC. There are so you can buy a standard ESC and, and send it off to one of the guys that we race with, and he'll flash it for you. Uh, or you can buy it flashed to to drop the RPM um, already, and then just a standard 35, 36 size motor. So dead dead easy to get into. Again, kind of costings for, uh, for for the club classes. So if you buy a, a brand spanking new everything on Club 32, you're going to be looking at around 350 quid, but they always come up secondhand. So if, if, you, if you're looking to get into it and you're worried about the cost, again, just let us know, keep an eye out on the forums and that there'll be some coming up and you can get 
a, a ready to fly Club 32 model in, in pretty good nick for 140 quid. Um, E2K, about the same. You know, if you buy all new, you're looking at around 245. But if you want to do it on the cheap, keep an eye out, speak to people. You can get one pretty cheaply for about 130 quid. You do need probably at least two or three batteries for an E2K race day, just so that you don't have to, um, you, you're going to have time to charge them. Um, but, you know, a lot of people have these batteries around anyway. So a typical club meeting, so a short course. We usually get to the field, it might be Buckminster, the, uh, the BMFA National Centre, um, that we have a lot of our race meetings there, or it might be uh, a random field in Shropshire like this one's at. Um, and we, we tend to, to arrive around 8.30, arrive and set up, put your models together, put the course up. Around 9.30, we have a pilot's briefing, all stand around, waffle. Um, by 10 a.m., we aim to have the, the first models on the line. This is uh, Andy and his son Danny launching off. So first race, flag drops at 10 a.m. And then at 11.30, we'll have changeover. So at the start of the, at the start of the day, you'll be split into two groups, and it's usually on the short course to split between classes. So Club 32 might fly first and then E2K second. So halfway through the morning, around 11.30, we'll have changeover. Um, and if you've been flying, what you'll typically then do during when the other uh, lot are flying, you'll, then you'll go and marshal the course. Uh, be one of the judges that we were talking about earlier. One o'clock, we have a quick lunch, generally filled with fast-paced repairs. Uh, for one thirty, racing restart, back on the line. And then again in the afternoon, we have a changeover. You notice the time that it takes in the afternoon has come down a little bit. And that is generally because there's been some attrition and not many people are, or not as many people are going out to the line. Uh, this was, uh, I think, yeah, that was mine actually. 4.30, um, a lot of people have kind of driven a long way and um, got a few people coming from Southampton and all around the country. So we, we try and finish as early as we can, give people time to get back and uh, not get too big a bollocking off the better halves. Um, bit of a prize giving and packing up. If you don't live too far away, there's a nice pub down the road from Buckminster. So it's a pretty, really social affair, especially the the short course racing. Everyone's in it to help each other. Uh, everyone, if, you know, if you don't have a caller, don't worry about it. There'll always be someone there to run out, put a helmet on, and and, uh, and call for you. And uh, yeah, just a, a nice, good atmosphere. If, even if you've got a problem with your airframe, you'll generally find that the whole pits will kind of get round and, and get you back flying again. So to kind of finish off, why pile on? Uh, as with kind of most model flying, it's the people. Uh, I've met from doing F3D and, and FII racing, I've, I've met people from all around the world, I've got some amazing friends in Holland and America, and um, they're just absolutely brilliant. You know that uh, someone described it as the, the kind of, Twi biannual uh, pylon family. Every every couple of years, we we just go on meet up, and it's like we we saw each other a week ago, kind of thing. Get pissed for a week at a World Championships. Well, not quite a World Championships, but um, and then uh, and then kind of you know head home. See you in see you in a couple of years. So amazing people. Um, the adrenaline rush. What you'll find is that even if you if you've never done pylon get in, do E2K, and it's a, a big buzz. You'll get used to it, E2K, step up to Club 32, and then you introduce a bit of noise, and that, that buzz will come right back again. Uh, if, if that becomes a bit samey to you, which I guarantee it'll take a long time, uh, come and do it, some FIR racing, get a quarter 40 model going. And, uh, and then finally, when you get to uh, an F3D meeting, when, when three F3D engines start up at an international um, meeting and, and you're kind of on the sticks on one of them. There's just nothing like it. There's no, uh, there's, yeah, there's just no feeling like it. Again, as I said, it's you against the clock, black and white, dead simple. It can be cheap if you want to do it. E2K is a, a, a kind of, you know, dead easy way into pylon. And uh, I think, I think it's, it's fun because it's really challenging. You know, when you, 
when you've worked so hard and, and everything's got to be right. And like saying, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You've got to go out to the line and it's got to work every single time. And you've got to, you've just got to put in those heats and come back. That's how you're going to win a meeting. Um, everything that, that can go wrong in pylon will go wrong at some point. Uh, so just, just ironing out all those issues, um, really important. So, yeah. Uh, last slide that I've got uh, here for you is, is some, some resources. Um, so there's a pylonracing.co.uk, the kind of BNPRA homepage. Uh, lots more information on there. Go, go take a look. And that, that's got more links on it as well. So that'll spread you out. Barry's uh, kindly offered to put his email on, on this slideshow. So um, if you want to get in contact directly with Barry, if you want to come racing, anything like that, if you've got any further questions, give him an email. And then, uh, of course, Facebook's taking over our lives. So um, we've got the BNPRA um, Facebook group. So if you if you put into Facebook exactly that uh, between the quotes, that'll bring you up that group. And we're all talking on there. And well, a lot of the information about meetings is on there. Um, and then some kind of uh, some links to suppliers and, and more Facebook groups here. So uh, you, you can buy all, all the kit that you need. Um, fr from these suppliers and there's there's a huge amount more out there uh, so, so so get digging in get asking on the Facebook group if, if you want if you need anything and uh, I'm sure there'll be someone coming to help you um, so that's all I've got I think I hopefully I didn't over overrun too much and uh, didn't waffle on it's pretty fast paced so I was kind of trying to cram in a lot of info and uh, yeah I hope you enjoy it thank you very much for listening Ollie fantastic Ollie. Fantastic. Really, really comprehensive. Thank you very much for that. Can I just get in and be really cheeky and ask just one question? What sort of what's the sort of typical airspeed you're, you're, you're getting on the F3Ds? Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. So F3D is there's, there's obviously no diving. So if, if you if you've climbed and, and dived, then you've done something wrong. So um, but even in a straight line, we're, we're pushing 200 mile an hour, we're getting to about uh, kind of 100 and 195 miles an hour. The the course 40 is uh, a little bit less. They're about 185, but but pretty close. You know, if you, if you can fly a quarter 40 model, you can fly an F3D model. Um, and uh, when you when you move to E2K and Club 32, they uh, they're, they're around about kind of 120 to 130 mile an hour. E2K is a little bit slower than Club 32. Um, I would class them as as quick club models. You know, if if you've um, had a, a club a model come to your flying club that wasn't a pylon racer and you've thought, oh, that's that's a quick model. Wow, kind of that's how fast they are. Right. Cool. Thank you. Got a got a few questions for the panelists here. I don't I? from Raymond, are all the races run anti-clockwise, i.e. left turns only, no right turn racing? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's, there's a problem of where the marshals sit. Um, we don't like the models flying, coming around the bend at the marshals. So if you, if, you, if you race in opposite directions, we have to keep moving the marshals. So they're always anti-clockwise. Mark Tilbury asks, should there be a limit to the cost of an entry-level race model kit, E2K or C32? Prices seem to be rising. Should they be capped? Oh, interesting. I'll, I'll pick up on, on that one. Um, you could see there was quite some difference in the pricing of, of the models, whether you went the second-hand route or the, the new route. Um, yeah, I think we're, at, we're about where we want to be price-wise. You know, the price we gave there, 350 that was a brand-new engine which retains its value. That was with good servos, you know, good digital high voltage servos and we allow 85 pounds or something for the servos so you could um do that for a lot less than than the, that was that was worst case scenario the model behind me that's that's no way that cost me 350 pounds okay thank you thanks barry um adam darby how much power or amps are used for e2k That's I think, um, oh, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, 
what I can tell you is that after a kind of 60, 70 second heat, the batteries come out pretty toasty. So I, th I think they're pulling around uh, 50 amps on a, on a 4S battery. In uh, E2K, we, we don't measure the power. In, uh, in that electric class F5D, or F3E as it's known, uh, they have a, a watt limit, uh, which is 1,000 watt minutes. So you, it, it's up to you how you expend that. Um, so you, so if, you can, if you try and overprop it or to go or, you know, with, a, with a big prop in order to go faster, you're going to use too much power. And by the end of lap eight, you'll have, you, the engine will cut. Uh, in, in E2K, the, everybody uses the same prop. It's an APC 8x8, and uh, they use the same motor pretty much. And the, uh, the limiter that um, Ollie talked about, it's limited to about 15,100 RPM. So everybody, so you, 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 can't, you can't fiddle with the prop or you know, shorten it to make it more RPM or anything. It's limited. So everybody's running the same batteries. They're running through the same limiter at the same RPM uh, with the same prop. So basically, it's it's a pilot-driven um, uh, sport. You know, it's not it's not to be technical. That's the whole point of it. Okay, thank you, um, Tony Butterworth asks: Any plans to get pylon racing back into the magazines to provide improved communication? I think I think yeah. I think we're always looking at uh, ways that we can communicate. We've we've found it kind of difficult. We've got the Facebook groups, but until people know where to look for the Facebook groups, um, it, it, it's always kind of difficult talking to everyone and without annoying people that don't want to don't want to listen. Um, magazines can can be you know it's not free to advertise in a magazine uh, or kind of rarely is unless you've got a deal. And uh, we we kind of haven't thought that it's been the uh, the the most efficient route for our funds um but it's it's, it's something we consider um don't, don't don't know if we'll we'll do it but yeah we'll, we'll take it away and we'll, we can talk about it yeah thank you i think uh, uh, we, we see now is that uh the facebook and social media is very powerful i'm not on facebook but you know since we started uh good um use of uh, of of that social media and these this kind of thing I, I mean this zoom webinar very pleased with it really really good um i think that uh, that this is a more modern way to uh, to, to to put the message out i think we also got jonathan Thompson there uh, he remembered flying at um Bewley and oxford be great to see you flying again, Jonathan. If you get in contact with me afterwards, um, we 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 can meet up and COVID restrictions allowing and and, and get you flying again. After well, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll email everybody who registered for tonight the a link to the so they can download uh, all these slides, so they'll have all the contact details and the links and everything that they need. Ollie, I know you've done an amazing thing, but I'm not sure you've got a crystal ball. But uh, Paul asks, are club events, uh, sorry, is there a demo or race at Western Park this summer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I was disappointed. We, we were going to go to Western uh, this year. Obviously, it all got cancelled, unfortunately. Um, yeah, my aim is to, is to get some of the shows this year again, dying to get out there and see everyone do a bit of flying. So uh, we'll definitely try and, and get something something going. Uh, I, I did a couple of years ago fit one with with lights and we flew it kind of at, at dusk. I don't think we could say we flew it at night, but it was getting pretty dark. So uh, yeah, we might try and bring that one out again. That's good fun. I think there's another one here. I've just spotted that uh, right, right there was something about yeah, Peter Harvey. What is the recommended C rating for a battery in E2K? We don't. Uh, we've, we've never recommended a C rating. <clears throat> I've. Uh, I've tried most of them from 20C to 60C, and I have gone as fast with all of them. So even a cheap uh, 20C battery has gone as fast as an expensive battery, because with the uh, with the limiter on board, you, it's not a powerhouse. You know, you, you are restricting it quite a bit, so you don't need big horsepower in a battery. So 20C will get you round. Better if you add 40, but 20C would do. Thank you. Um, Got another one here from Paul Jewell. Um, are club events run 
all around the country? No, I mean, the uh, short call stuff, sorry, Ollie. <laughs> yeah, um, but we do, 99% of it is now at Buckminster, at the BMFA uh, flying site. That's quite central for everyone to get to, you know, you know up, up north and down south, it's two, two and a half hours and you're, and you're there. So that's where it generally is for the short course. The, the long course is a tricky one because we prefer a nice billiard ball bit of tarmac to fly from. Um, and most of the time nowadays, we would be at uh, RAF uh, Barkston Heath. Okay. Thank you. Uh, right, Mark Aris had a Myro Urban Voodoo some time back. Was there ever a racing class for those or just too small? Three cell on a three inch prop was amazing. Yeah, they, they were great fun. Um, I, I raced a... I raced a, a voodoo. That's a, and there was a class internationally. It was called a 400 class. Um, so they, I think they actually used to run them on brushed 400 motors. Uh, so it was kind of like a cheaper way into the the F5D. Uh, we, I, I, I did race one as I was moving into F5D on a brushless setup. They are really difficult for the judges to see. We had we had some problems with them. Um, we we now do say that. If you're going to come racing, you, you've got to bring a race legal model. Um, we've, we've had some problems. I saw there was a, a comment in the chat about, uh, you know, kind of bring the kind of uh, EF extra or um, that kind of stuff. Uh, we, we now don't allow that purely so that we've got uh, an idea over how the models are manufactured. Um, we, we do some uh, level of scrutineering at the, the beginning of the, of the day. Um, so unfortunately, no, there's, there, there might be internationally still. I don't think it's raced very much, but there was a 400 class, but we don't race it in the UK. You can see here the scrutineering mark of the model. All, all of the uh, models are scrutineered now. Um, for a simple set of safety checks. Um, and we really don't want to allow unmandated um, models. The question there that I can answer. <laughs> I was saving that one. From, from, from James Ford there, which is the best pub by Buckminster. <laughs> <laughs> the closest well, one. Arms in Buckminster is very good. And if you want a good meal, go into Colsterworth to the White Lion. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Tony Butterworth, which classic models now popular in many aspects of model flying, i.e. classic aerobatics, do you think that, do you think that models from the 60s to 70s, 60 to 70 S, i.e. classic pylon, would be popular in uh, sat man-eaters and phaetons, 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 etc.? Okay. So... Tony, KMB 40S, and Paul and I are going to build two man, uh, two bobcats, genuine bobcats. Paul's got his pro line radio for it. But seriously, the best retro is really still a tracer. You know that, that model behind me is that wings from 1977 design, um, and it still flies lovely. You know, do a tissue covered one with a Eco 19 in it, and you, you, you've just gone back for 45 years. I hope that answers the question, Tony. Brilliant, thank you, Andy. I'm just seeing if we got any more questions there. Uh, there's a question from David Murray, uh, was asking if there's a demo race at Western Park this summer. We've asked that one, but that's fine. Okay, yeah, no, that's all right. <laughs> in that case. There's one. Um, there's, a, there's a quick one, David Murray. Is there, is there any development work using digitally printed airframes? Um, so, as far as I'm aware, no one at the moment is is uh, 3D printing or digitally digitally printing uh, airframes. There are people uh, doing uh, components of flying parts, and uh, Barry and, and Nathan have been involved recently, which you can see on the Facebook page about uh, 3D printing a plug which they then pulled a mold from to, uh, to do composite parts from. So uh, we, we've 
we've got no one racing kind of a fully 3D printed airframe at the moment, but lots of that technology is making its way in and influencing us and we're using it uh, to kind of allow us to develop the airframes quicker and quicker. Brilliant, thank you. Philip, Philip, I, uh, I think Barry's speaking E2K okay. Wingtech. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are we still on the chat with the um, 3D printing stuff, Ollie? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, so this is um, Wingtip, new Wingtip for the tracer in the background, the model in the background, up, upswept. Um, Wingtip, so that's 3D printed, and that will be a 3D printed flying part. We're not going to take a mold from it or anything like that. It's just going straight onto the end of the foam wing, and it's going to be flown. And that's printed with um, just on a very cheap printer, a second-hand Dremel printer, uh, Dremel 3D20. Does really good. Really good work. We also have a few internal parts of the model are 3D printed as well. Just small things, control horns and parts to hold the aerials of the receiver, that sort of thing. Thank you, Barry. Um, how many race meetings would you normally have in a year? Wayne Butler asks. We, uh, for the, uh, the, the short course, we generally have about six uh, six individual meetings, uh, seven when you count the BMFA nationals. Um, with the long course, uh, yeah, we, we aim for sort of about five, six, including the, the nationals. Uh, some of the long courses, there's a lot of stuff in uh, in Europe, which we used to be able to go to, but obviously we don't know yet. Um, so, you know, it, it can get very busy through the summer over here and, and in Europe. So at, at least four to five for the big course and at least six for the short course. Brilliant. Thank you. Philip Lewis asks, has there been any thought or discussion on having an open electric class, e.g. a limit on the voltage used? You can do what you want with everything else, because a lot of people who might be interested have no have no, and don't want any IC experience, but want to use open class, want it to open class. As soon as you as soon as you start uh, saying kind of unlimited, you, you move towards FAI and then and they kind of um, limit the rules. Uh, or, or kind of guide the rules um, so that it's not truly unlimited because that, that's not racing. Um, but, but it is, you know, there's a lot of development you can do there. What, what you're describing is basically the F5 interpret that as, as uh, F3E, um, what's known as F5D. And the way that they limit the power there, there is a voltage cap. That you're only allowed 5S maximum LiPos, um, but they also uh, have a, a power limit. So uh, they, they run a thousand watt minutes. So if you're running a thousand watts, you will get a minute's worth of runtime. If you're running 2000 watts, you'll get 30 seconds of runtime. So the skill there is about going efficient on the drive chain. Uh, they've, they've gone to now very large props. I think they're running something like 13 inch diameter by 25 inch pitch. So they're, they're getting these really big, efficient props turning quite slowly, but the pitch speed is, is very high still uh, to drive the efficiency up. So, um, yeah, as soon as you start saying limited, the cost will shoot straight up. Uh, but if that's what you want to do, go for it. Yeah, it's good fun. Let's see what you can come up with. Fantastic. Um, um, Kevin Anderson, um, he, he, he sent an answer about flying at Bewley Club 20. He says, not sure my age would be good for the reaction time now, though. We, we've got some quite old guys come along to E2K. got very young people, some down 10, 11 years old flying, um, but also up at sort of 75, 80 years old. You know, we there's, there's people at the race meetings, particularly the club classes of all abilities. You know, there's something there for everyone. So don't, don't be put off, Kevin. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I think we'll take this, this, just this last one, because it's a little bit of congratulatory from Mark Tilby. Just wanted to add, I started racing last year and it's a great group of guys and anyone is welcome. Please thank all the guys for me. Paul is doing a great job. So I think that's, that's really nice to hear that. Um, and sorry, there is one more, Ollie, you may want to, to 
to, to answer this one. Uh, for E2K, what motors and batteries and ESCs would you recommend for quality and performance? Yeah, it, easy one. Um, so there's there's a, a set list of, of uh, motors and ESCs that you can buy. Uh, I know Nexus Models has actually got a, a whole page dedicated to E2K equipment. Um, in terms of batteries, as we were saying, that, that obviously if you if you can can get a, a kind of 30, 40 C battery, then brilliant. You, you you can do it with less. The way that it's limited on RPM means you don't need the best the best equipment. Uh, but yeah, the, the, you, you do want equipment that will kind of last, and so that's where your money should go. Um, but yeah, take a look at the the kind of the links that are are in the end of this slide, and um, and and that'll that'll direct you to all the equipment. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I think. Um, so somebody, no, I'm just picking up some background noise from somewhere. I think it's a bit of um, feedback on Ollie's there. All ah, right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, I think it's, uh, we're, we're past the witching hour again. So I think we're going to uh, thank Ollie, thank the team and um, look forward to, to meeting everybody again, hopefully next Tuesday. Um, we've got another seminar there. Please log on to the website. Take a, a good look at that. Um, get registered. We'd like to get the numbers up again. We had nearly 200 today. Um, and uh, let's see if we can get it over, over the 200 barrier. The, the link for next week's about to appear, appear in the chat box. There we go. <laughs> right. And I think we should uh, thank everybody for joining us on YouTube. There was uh, a couple of dozen on there watching as well. Thank so, you. And you can always you can always catch up on YouTube.